And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, the Sussexes have been on a relentless charm offensive in America, embracing all the woke mumbo-jumbo that Hollywood has to offer. But in a rock-bottom moment, the X-rated US satire South Park has teased an episode fittingly named World Privacy Tour, and the X-royals get truly roasted. Look. Seriously, it's driving me crazy. I'm sick of hearing about them, but I can't get away from them. They're everywhere in my face. Look, Kyle, we just kind of don't care about some dumb prince and his stupid wife. Dumb prince and his stupid wife. So with the PR campaign not exactly going to plan, the couple are on the lookout for the next money-making scheme. And it's now been uncovered that they're working with one of Hollywood's top venture capitalists, Adam Lillian, who specialises in introducing celebs to business startups. According to Page Six, Lillian first met the Sussexes through the chat show host and one of his other clients, Alan DeGeneres. And in an unconfirmed rumour, Meghan Markle is also alleged to have met with Gordon Getty, the American billionaire and son of oil tycoon J. Paul Getty. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by Meghan Markle's biographer, Tom Bauer. So, Tom, you look at that South Park uh, clip, the South Park's have become exactly what they never wanted. They're now a punchline in America, even amongst the liberal American media. But it hasn't stopped their money-making drive, which actually seems to be ratcheting up a notch. What's going on? Well, I think their priority is earning money. Uh, the, the, but the veneer is always charity. They pretend always that they are philanthropists. They are eager to hand out cash to people who need it. But it's very noticeable that when Harry said he was going to give a large chunk of his advance on his sensational book to charity, it's now just a little bit, and he hasn't quantified it. So I think they're keeping the money, but parading themselves as philanthropists and people who are anxious to help the downtrodden. But, of course, the one most important are downtrodden, are they themselves? Because the most cynical thing about these business advisors who they seem to have signed up with is that their whole raise and detra is to say, we're going to make you look like you're charitable, but actually we're going to make you very rich at the same time. It's deeply cynical, Tom. Well, it's cynical, as was the whole departure from Britain and is the whole of this, uh, the Netflix series and the book, I'm the victim, when in fact they're the aggressors. And, you know, in truth, what we're seeing is an extraordinary marketing campaign by Meghan, whose number one interest is herself, and the second interest is money. And the question is, how will she make a lot of money in a short period of time in the end to make sure she doesn't need always to parade herself as the victim of the royal family? She's always looking for other business opportunities. And what's interesting is the people she goes to. Who is going to maximise Meghan's popularity? Who's going to make her really big and very rich? And she's, I think, very shrewd and clever in that. She's always looking for opportunities and for people who can help her. Now, Harry undoubtedly was one step, but will she keep Harry for long? Perhaps Harry will become redundant to her ambitions in the near future. Who knows? But you think this is about the couple saying, we know that this is peak money-making time. We want to be able to maintain this new lavish lifestyle for the rest of our lives, so we have to make a lot of money and fast. And maybe someone like Getty, who Meghan was apparently meeting up with, maybe she's going to get advice from him? On well, that. a lot of the advice and money, but, I mean, you know, what's terrible for the Sussexes is they haven't got really that much money compared to the other A-listers. I mean, if they've got 20 or $30 million amongst the A-listers who are billionaires, that is just a day's or a year's expenditure on food or, uh, and living. So they want more. So, they, of course, they're poor compared to their neighbours. And Meghan feels that more than anything. That is, after all, why she was so dissatisfied with Frogmore. She wanted a palace, not five cottages knocked into a sort of small home in Windsor. So, they're really... She's really looking for the big time. The question is whether Harry appreciates that, whether he really wants to go along that ride. Is he really so money-oriented as she is? I mean, she only sees dollars everywhere. She only sees zillions. She wants to ride in the big Cadillacs, the private jets on command. At the moment, she has to scrounge for those sort of things. So and she's, on a, she's on a treadmill, which is fast. She wants to get there faster than tomorrow. We still haven't seen her, Tom. Is that we, part of the story? Of course. The mystery is there. That's the great thing. And she, she's pretty clever. She really is. She's making herself scarce while she puts the next 
huge expose, the next uh, theatre opportunity together, and then she will unveil herself. I oh, know, look, I want to move on to another big story, Tom. BBC chairman Richard Sharp continues to be scrutinised over the extent of his involvement in securing Boris Johnson an £800,000 loan. And during BBC Snooze Night uh, yesterday, establishment broadcaster Jonathan Dimbleby said that Sharp and not its army of left-wing journalists had damaged the Beeb's reputation as an impartial broadcaster watch. No doubt he's an honourable man, incidentally. No doubt at all. I have no reason to doubt that. That what he should do honourably is to fall on his sword and say, in the interests of the BBC, which I care about, I don't want this to go on and on and on. I shall stand aside. So, look, the, the BBC journalists obviously don't like Richard Sharp because he's a Tory, but you have doubts about whether Sharp should actually remain in his role. Oh, look, I worked for the BBC for 26 years. It was in my veins. It was the most wonderful organisation to work for. Richard Sharp's time in the BBC is limited. It's not if, but when he goes. He was a rotten appointment. And looking back over past chairman, there have been a succession of rotten appointments. He's not the first banker who's had to go. Gavin Davis, who was the Labour appointment, was forced to resign because he was no good. And there have been others too, like Richard Clementi and others. And Chris Patton, the Tory, was a dreadful chairman. It's a very difficult job. And Richard Sharp was a rotten appointment from the outset. He is a banker who hates journalists, who doesn't understand broadcasting, who thought he could impose his will and impartiality and all the rest, and actually restore some sort of uh, equilibrium and get more right-wing views. But he doesn't understand the medium. He was a rotten appointment. He's a ro wrong sort of man. And the sooner he goes, the better. And to be, interested, to be totally true about this and candid, he was Boris's appointment, and Boris formally wanted Charles Moore, who had been a bad appointment too, and he was doing Sharp a favour because Sharp wanted a public role. But he didn't know what he was getting into. And what really exposed him was this investigation into the lies that Martin Bashir told on behalf of Panorama to get that famous interview with Diana. When Richard Sharp appeared before the Parliamentary Committee answering for the BBC's shameful cover-up and lies over 25 years, and more importantly, in the last couple of years, he completely failed to convince the committee or the BBC staff. And that was when he began, the rot began to be sown, because he went along with a, what was a whitewash by a judge about what the BBC had done recently to cover up the cover-up. Because he didn't understand, because he's not political enough, because he has the banker's arrogance, and therefore he's got to go. The Tory government must now appoint somebody who understands journalism, who understands broadcasting, who has an empathy with the staff, and most important of all, who the staff respect. So and the appearance isn't that it's a political appointment, it's that Richard Sharp didn't actually have the skills required to be chairman. Well, he was appointed by Boris as a favour, and that was a terrible mistake. And he's been exposed, because what these people never understand is they may be giants at Goldman Sachs or in the city, but once you get such a high-profile job as chairman of the BBC, then you're there for the pay taking by the staff if you get it wrong. And Sharp has got it majorly wrong, so he's got to go. Tom Bauer, absolutely fascinating as always. Thank you so much. We will speak okay. next week.